I want to welcome those who are joining us online again. We're glad that you have tuned in. This is a high Sabbath for us, Pastor Carlos. Not only is it Sabbath, which is a blessing in and of itself, but our whole focus for today and tomorrow morning is the Three Angels Messages. Amen. How many of you have enjoyed three presentations so far last night and this morning? Amen. Woo! Love Pastor Shin, powerful, powerful stuff, and that we're just getting started. We we're are. just getting our feet wet. So what does it look like for the rest of the day? Well, first of all, you don't have to go anywhere because we're providing lunch. So immediately following our presentation this morning, we're going to be providing lunch for everyone that's here. I'm sorry for those online. We can't help you with that. But we're going to have lunch. And then right at 2 p.m., we're going to start up again for our afternoon presentation. And as they say, we're keeping the best to last. So you don't want to miss this afternoon. What's happening this afternoon? Amen. At 2 o'clock, we have David Shin. Dr. Shin will be back with us again. He's going to be talking about where it says, fear God and give him glory. And so then we have at 2 o'clock. At 3 o'clock, we have somebody called Pastor John Ross, who's going to be talking about the hour of his judgment. And then we have at 4 o'clock, we have Daniel Hudgens with the doomsday of Babylon. Mm. And, and then so we have a full afternoon. Yes. And then we're going to have a break, right? Yep. We're going to have supper. And once again... We're going to feed you. So you're going to get spiritual food. And, of course, we're going to make sure you get your physical food as well. We're going to have following our supper program, Pastor John Lomacain. It's not on our schedule, but we want to tell you about it. He's going to be doing a mini concert for us for about 20 minutes right after supper. So you're welcome to stay for that. And then the evening presentations. And then after he sings, then he's going to preach. He's going to preach on the topic, Deranged, the Wine of Babylon. And then at 7 o'clock, we have uh, Dwayne Lemon is going to be with us. He's going to be speaking about all the w true worshipers. Please stand up. But that is not the last presentation of the light because we are going to finish tonight at 8 o'clock with a Q&A with all the speakers here. Amen. That's right. So you don't want to miss that. You might have a Bible question related to the Three Angels series, not necessarily to the Three Angels message, maybe to Bible prophecy or just the Christian life in general. You can uh, write down your Bible question, give it to uh, Pastor Carlos or Daniel or myself, and we'll try and get that in the lineup for questions. For those of you who are watching online, if you're on social media, you can type the question right there, and we're going to try and answer as many of those questions this evening. And then tomorrow morning, what time do we start? Tomorrow morning, we're going to start here at 8.30. At tomorrow morning at 8.30, we have John Lomacain, Double Trouble. Then you have another guy called Carlos Munoz. He's going to be mm -hmm. talking about the mark and the seal, marked for eternity. Daniel Hudgens at 10.30. And then the last presentation, we're going to have Dwayne Lemon is going to close tomorrow morning also with the call to endurance, Revelation 14.12. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a great series of presentations. I've been blessed already. I know you will be blessed throughout today. We do have some additional church-related announcements. So those of you who are joining us online for the series, just bear with us. Just some housekeeping items that we need to do. The first, Pastor Carl. Carlos has to do with our outreach, our local outreach here at the Granite Bay Church. Yes, our outreach ministry is going to restart next Sabbath at 3 o'clock. We meet over at the Amazing Facts building, and we're going to do something a little bit special. We have a group of people that have already been training. They're giving Bible studies, and we're going to strengthen them. We have some resources. But we also have, for if you are here and you have never given a Bible study in your life, you've never had, you just heard David Shin talk about that face-in-face -face encounter, sharing with other people. If you have never given a Bible study in your life, we're going to have a special training next Sabbath at 3 o'clock, specifically tailored for you. For, to help you how to give a Bible study to a friend or a family member or a co-worker, somebody you know. It's a very simple, very basic. So we want you to join us. We're going to give you the resources. And we're, we're basically going to give it to you all because we want to help you so that you can help others to get to see the face of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so next Sabbath at 3 o'clock, please, if you've never given a Bible study and you say, you know what, I want to do it, I, but I don't know how to. Next Sabbath at 3 o'clock, me and John Q will be there, and we're going to give you a special resource for those so you can share with your loved ones. All right, so that's going to be happening tomorrow, not tomorrow, next Sabbath next afternoon. Sabbath. You don't want to miss that, how to share your faith and do a Bible study. A couple other quick announcements for our church members. We want to remind you we do have a church business meeting that will be taking place at the end of the month. It's January the 25th is going to be our church business meeting. So all church members are encouraged to participate in that. There's also an announcement there about the elders meeting and the board meeting. And then one additional announcement, we want to welcome a uh, newly a baptized member, a part of the Granite Bay Church. Uh, a Friday evening, Pastor John, I mean, Pastor Carlos, we did a special baptism Friday evening, and Ashley D. was baptized. Amen. And you I were involved the in the baptism. That's right. Yes. It was a, a special event. And we just want to officially welcome her and vote her in as a member of the Granite Bay Church. And I know Ashley's out there, and she doesn't want me to point her out, but she's out there. 
So we want to officially welcome Ashley as part of our church family. Church members, all those in favor, if you could raise your hand. Amen. All right. Well, welcome, Ashley. Welcome as an official member of the Granite Bay Church. Well, at this time, we're going to invite you to stand as we sing our call to worship. And again, we are grateful that Pastor John Loma Cain is going to lead us. Let's stand. You'll see the words on the screen. It's, We Have This Hope. Loving Father, it is a joy and a privilege to come in this holy place on this holy day to study your holy word. And Lord, we thank you for that freedom. Most of all, we thank you for the promise that when we come together in your name that you are there with us. Lord, I pray that every individual, both those here presently, those who are watching, will sense your presence, that you'll speak to our hearts, help us learn how to better represent you to share you and to live out your life within our hearts. We thank you, pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> Today's offering is for the church budget and actually, in reality, the church offering today, all loose offering is actually going to be for um, offsetting some of the expenses that we're having because of the Amazing Facts Summit. Anytime you have one of these summits, there are definitely some extra expenses involved. And so if you know, I give either to the church budget or any loose offerings, like I said, um, they will be going towards uh, offsetting some of these wonderful expenses. After church today or the service today, you'll see um, lunch is provided, and then there's dinners provided tonight, and there's many, many different things that go into putting on a presentation like this. So uh, again, thank you for your generosity in advance. And the way do we do things here, if you're a visitor, is that we actually don't pass around the offering plate here at the Offertory Appeal. Deacons will be available at the uh, exits at the end of church, and um, they will be standing there, obvi obviously, with the offering plate, and you can put your uh, gifts in there if you like. Now, another way to give, if you're not aware of this, is you can always go onto your phone or if you have a computer, and you can go to the Granite Bay Church website, and if you click on Donate on the Granite Bay Church website, it will lead you to a, a website called Adventist Giving, and you can actually go ahead and submit all of your gifts uh, in whatever category that you want directly online, and you can even do that on your phone. But a little hidden secret that a lot of people are not aware of is that Adventist Giving actually has their own app. So if you have a smartphone, which most people do, you can go to the App Store, and on the App Store you can download Adventist Giving. And you will now have it on the app. You can bypass going on a web browser or bringing up the website. You can go directly to that app, Adventist Giving, and you can go ahead and give your offerings and your gifts directly just like that. Very convenient, very simple, very easy. Now, last year, we're still doing the, uh, the, number, the numbers and finishing up the books uh, for 2021. 
But it looks like we may have had a record year in church budget uh, offering. Can anybody say amen? amen? And as you know, we also had a new budget halfway through. So to actually surpass that is a reflection of your generosity and obviously God's grace. You may wonder, well, how much? How much over? Or what are the actual numbers? Well, you'd actually have to come to the church business meeting where we will discuss those things. In fact, I heard a rumor that the tithe this year, 2021, was actually a record year in tithe. Um, can anybody say amen to that? So how much over in a tithe? What is the record number? Well, you'd have to come to the church business meeting <laughs> for us to be able to decide that. See, the church business meeting is really like, you know, in sports, quick analogy, it's like we're in the locker room. And there are no cameras, there's no media, it's just the players and the coaches, and our, in our instance, it's the members and the pastors. We talk about very important things. We haven't had a church business meeting in a long time. So there's one coming up in the next week and a half. You have it in the bulletin there. Please make it a point to come out to their church business meeting where we can talk about a lot of the church business. Again, we want to thank each and every one of you on behalf of the pastoral staff for your wonderful generosity uh, in the last year, your faithful giving. And I leave you with this one verse here, um, <clears throat> Proverbs 11:25. the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you have been so good to us. You've been so generous. You provided so much. And all of these things, Lord, are yours. And so we just give back a little something as a token um, of your love and our thankfulness for all that you continue to do for us in the Grand Bay Church. Take these gifts, Lord, and may you use them to your will to uh, glorify your name and spread the everlasting gospel. Thank you so much, Lord, for all that you continue to do for Granite Bay Church. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come forward for the children's story, which will be given by Angie Lomaki. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Can I see a Sabbath smile? Can I see a Sabbath smile? Some of you won't give me one, but that's okay. Boy, you look so beautiful today. Well, I'm going to share a story with you about a little boy. Who wants to be my little Johnny? I need a little boy that could be a Johnny for me. Raise your hand if you want to be Johnny. You want to be Johnny? Okay. Oh, she said she want to be Johnny. There's girls named Johnny. Come here, little Johnny. You want to be my Johnny today? Okay. All right. You can stand right here, and I'll tell you when to come. Just stand right there, okay? How many of you have plants at home? You do? Okay. How many of you ever grown a plant with seeds? You have? Okay. Well, I'm going to share a story with you that happened a long time ago in a faraway place. I came all the way from Illinois to tell this story today. Well, 
There was a the little boy by the name of Johnny. And Johnny, I'll tell you when to come, OK? So you just wait a second. But there was a king. And the king lived in a big castle. How many of you have ever been to a castle before? You have, yeah. And he lived in a big castle. And he had a big village. And one day he said, I want everybody. Well, he blew the horn. Do, 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 do. And everybody came out. He's, all the people came out. And he says, here he, here he. Boys and girls, moms and dads, I want everybody to come in front of me. And so he looked over all these people that were in front of him. And he says, I'm going to give you all a seed. Do you know what a seed is? Yes, OK. What do you do with seeds? Plant them. So everybody got their seed. And they were so happy to get their seed. And they took their seed. And they um, took the seed. And they put it in a pot. Well, little Johnny, I don't know if you could hold this pot. It's kind of heavy. Can you hold this? Don't drop it. Oh, OK. OK, little Johnny held his pot. And he was so excited to hold his pot. And he was happy. Give me a happy smile. <laughs> and little Johnny was so happy because he, no, keep being happy. Keep being happy, little Johnny. And smile again, smile, yes. And little Johnny planted his seeds in this pot. And everybody planted their seeds in their pot. And so when little Johnny planted his seed and they put the dirt in, what do you have to do to make your plant grow? Water. Water, what else? Sunlight. And what? Sunlight. Say it again. Sunlight. Sunlight, anything else? Yes? Huh? Soil. Soil, there we go. What else to make it grow? Way over there. Air. Air, okay. All right, that's enough right now. So little Johnny, he was so happy and he was planting, he was taking care of his pot and he was so happy doing this, watering and putting it in the sunshine. But guess what? Nothing was growing. Little Johnny was sad. Give us a sad face, little Johnny. No, a sad face. No, not a happy. <laughs> little Johnny, yeah, okay. They <laughs> little Johnny was so sad because nothing was growing. And I forgot to tell you, the king says, I give you six months to grow that plant. And so, guess what? Little Johnny, oh, poor little Johnny is heavy, isn't it? Little Johnny was, um, plant was watering his plant and making sure everything was growing. And six months later, guess what? The, uh, little Johnny didn't see anything growing in his pot. And little Johnny was very, very sad about that. Let me, I don't want you to drop this, OK? OK, stay here. Stay there. Yeah, I'm not done with you. And so the king called everybody in. What's the sound to make when the king calls you in? Da, da, da. Come on, let me hear it. Da, 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 da. OK, you don't want to do it. So everybody came in. And they were so excited and so happy. And guess what? P look behind you. What do you see behind you? People bought a plant that looked like that, flowers, and um, even some green ones. People bought big plants. Look around you. Do you see flowers and plants? People bought plants, and some of them dragged their plants in. And guess what, little Johnny? Hold this again. Little Johnny bought his with just dirt in it. And little Johnny was sad. Give us one more time a sad face. No, sad. Yeah, yes. Give a frown. Aw. <laughs> little, little Johnny was sad again because Guess what? His plant, there was nothing in it. Everybody had big, beautiful plants. And the king says, I want everybody to walk in front of me with their plants. Everybody, some people brought, bought their big plants and grabbed, bought it in and pulled it in. Guess what? It was Johnny's turn. 
Johnny, why don't you walk across here? Little Johnny walked in front of the king. Okay, and little Johnny, turn around, come back, Johnny, come back. No, no, come back here. Yeah, there's a sad face. And little Johnny was so sad that he had nothing in his plant. So the king says, what do you have in your pot? And little Johnny says, this is all I have. What did you do with your seed? What did you do with your seed? You planted it, right? Mm -hmm. And what happened? Well, I don't know. Huh? I don't know. You don't know. It didn't grow. <laughs> It didn't grow. It was just dirt. There was nothing in it. So the king says, what is your name? What is your name? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> Say Johnny. I don't know. Okay, little Johnny. Anyway, he brought his pot in, and he was so sad. And the king says, is this what you've done with my, uh, the seed I gave you? Say yes. Say yes. Yeah. Yes, okay, okay. So he, this is what he did with the seed. And there was nothing in it, nothing. And little Johnny says, he says, oh no, I felt so bad. And he says, okay. He says, everybody else, sit down. Little Johnny, you stay right here. Guess what he did for Johnny? He said, Johnny, you have been honest. Johnny says, oh. He says, why? He says, because I gave everybody a seed and there was nothing in the seed. It was hollow, it was empty. But Johnny was the honest one. His seed, nothing grew, right? And he was honest. Everybody else was dishonest. They were not honest. And guess what? Johnny, you're gonna get a crown. You're going to get a crown, and you <laughs> smile for your crown. Give, give us a Sabbath smile. Come on. Give us a smile. Oh. <laughs> and you're going to get a robe. Oh. A cape. Wow, little Johnny. And, uh, and everybody was shocked. Why did he get the robe and the cape? Because he was honest. Was the seed empty or was there something in the seed? It was empty, it was hollow, nothing was in it. And Johnny was so happy. You're supposed to be happy, Johnny, come on. Yeah, Johnny was so happy that he, <laughs> Johnny was so happy that he won. Not won, but he was honest. And you know, boys and girls, it's so good to be honest in everything that you do. In Philippians 4, 8, whatever things are honest, pure, and good, that's what you are supposed to do. So thank you, Mr. Johnny. And you know, when you all get to heaven, the Lord is gonna give us all a robe and a crown. Every one of us, amen? Amen, all of us here too. I'm looking forward to mine, most of all to seeing my Jesus. Who would like to pray? Me, me. <gasps> okay, sweetie, come here. Yes, what's your name? Peyton. Okay, go ahead and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Have a wonderful day, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you. You may go back to your seats. Johnny, I got to take the robe, but you could take the crown. You could keep that, you could keep that. Of a 
rocks and trees of skies and seas his hands the wonders wrought this is my father's word oh let me of so strong God is the ruler yet this is my father's world why should my heart be sad the Lord is king let the heavens ring God reigns, let the earth be glad. The Lord is King, let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth be Please stand for a scripture reading. Our scripture will be found today in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. And it says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with man's hands as though he needs anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men who dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Please remain standing. seminar, we're going to do something a little different. So we're going to ask that you kneel where you are and not come forward at this time. But obviously, if you have special cares or concerns that you want to bring before the Lord, he will hear them from where you are. And at this time, I'm going to have Pastor John Loma King come out as we sing the call to prayer. Take our hearts and minds far away from the press of the world all around. To your throne where grace does abound. May our lives be transformed by your love. May our souls be refreshed from above. At this moment, let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer. Please kneel with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, on this beautiful Sabbath day, Lord, we just come before you as your children, humbled and grateful for all the things that you have done for us. Lord, we pray that today every word, every thought, every piece of music that we hear will be glorifying your name, and we want to give you all the praise as you deserve it. Lord, we do have many, many concerns. Um, we do have a lot of uh, members who are sick, who are ailing, dealing with financial troubles, challenges on their jobs. Lord, the list is long. 
but you know all these things. So we bring them before you as you have the ability to answer every single one of them and bring us peace and comfort, peace that passes all understanding. Lord, we ask for forgiveness of our sins, our trespasses against you, our neglect of you, being so distracted in this world. Lord, help us to make sure that we don't uh, lose our eyes on Jesus, Lord. Help us to remain focused during these uh, difficult times. Lord, we pray for a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit on every single member and family here, as well as the speakers of this uh, very important series. And we also lift up to you, your, your humble servant, Pastor Doug, here, as he's about to bring the special message here today in this church service. Lord, we pray for our world church, upcoming GC, and we pray that uh, you continue to send your Holy Spirit to the leaders of the church, help to unify them, help them stand boldly for your truth. Lord, thank you so much for listening to our prayers and answering them in your way and your time. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, friends. We're so thankful that you are here with us at the Hilltop Church this morning. And uh, those who are regular members here know that we're having a special Amazing Facts Summit weekend now dealing with Revelation's final warning, talking about the three angel messages that go to the world immediately prior to Jesus coming. I want to also welcome any that are visiting. We've met people already from other states that have flown in for this event. And uh, we always remember that we have the, uh, the lion's share of the people worshiping with us and studying with us now are on television, watching on AFTV, on the Good News Channel, Facebook, YouTube. And it's not too late right now to send a little note to your friends and say, you'll want to tune in for the remainder of this series. If you have not heard the first few presentations, they have been outstanding. My name is Doug Batchelor. I'm uh, blessed to be the senior pastor. Now they call them lead pastors. I like that name better. Senior starts to bother me as the years go by. But uh, of the church here, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing with you the subject this morning, dealing with worship him that made. Now, this is based upon the first angel's message you find in Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to put that up on the screen, and we'll be looking at that together. It says, and then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. This is Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, that's a megaphone, it actually means a megaphonal, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Many times in the Bible it makes it very clear that the God of the Bible is the creator. He is the one who made. In fact, part of this message, worship God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea, that's an excerpt directly from the fourth commandment. It says we worship him and he's picked a special day to worship him on the seventh day and it says for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea. But that's not going to be the specific focus of my message this morning. I think many of us understand the Sabbath truth. I'm going to be talking about he is the one who made. Because right now, we're living in a world that is very different from 200 years ago, where the vast majority of people believed that God created. That belief is under attack. And now approximately 50% of the people in North America and it varies from country to country around the world, no longer believe that God is the creator. They believe that um, things have slowly evolved. And that's a very dangerous belief because it affects whether or not you can worship him appropriately. So we need to start at the beginning. We have a starting point here. You know, one of the keys to happiness is you need to know something about past, present, and future. You must know where you came from, 
what you are doing here and where you are going in order for you to be secure and be happy and this just forms your whole life view I remember hearing about a boy that uh, came into the living room his mother was sitting on the couch and reading he had a very troubled look on his face and she said what's going on he said mom is it true in the Bible that God made man from the dust well yes and mom is it true that when you die you turn back into dust she said yes he said I'm almost sure there's someone under my bed and I don't know if they're coming or going <laughs> you need to know where you came from and where you're going so I I would submit to you this morning that unless you understand that God divinely created you cannot worship him the way he needs to be worshiped that's why this truth will shape your whole world view if you believe that everything happened over millions of years first of all you can't believe the Bible because Jesus makes it very clear that if you don't believe Moses Moses account of creation in Genesis literal six day seven day including the Sabbath of creation he said you don't believe Moses you cannot believe me and there's so many references in the Bible to God literally creating the heavens and the earth and doing it in that very rapid time span that you just have to start picking the Bible apart and pretty soon it stops being the inspired Word of God in your life so that's why this is such a critical subject to understand now I'm coming to you with this with a lot of personal passion because I grew up went to 14 different schools before I even went to college and virtually all of the schools taught evolution I believed it because that's what I was told I should also mention one of the bad side effects of the teaching of evolution is the rate of teenage suicide has gone up exponentially from 2.5 people 2.5 teenagers per 100,000 back in the 1950s to now about 18 a five-fold increase in teenage suicide when we started telling young people there's really no purpose for life that you've just evolved from lower forms of life and they figure they die they turn back into fertilizer it changes everything about your worldview so once I learned the truth on this I really began to study because for me it just didn't make sense how you could get organization and design from nothing I'd like to submit to you from my own personal study for my own benefit and understanding not only is it theology that teaches creation I believe that geology biology archaeology all support creation and so I'm gonna go through just and again we're doing a flyover here I don't have time to go in deep because this is a deep study that you could spend weeks on I'll be going over what some of the points are covering about 10 points of why I believe that God created and that he deserves our worship as our creator first of all there's something called the law of the conservation of mass this is a scientific law and in that law it basically says matter cannot be created or destroyed for the universe to come from nothing requires faith the idea that everything that we see suddenly came out of nowhere for no reason can you imagine that friends that one day everything came from nothing out of nowhere for no reason this is the teaching of evolution now, I don't know about you but that to me sounds like it takes faith there is nothing that we observe in the science world that would support that you say well once there was nothing and that nothing was nowhere because if you've got the vacuum of eternal nothingness then how do you know where you are you can't say I'm near the cactus or the rock because there are no cactus and no rocks and so out of the nothingness nowhere with no cause you need some cause to cause a big bang but nothing nowhere for no cause suddenly exploded and developed into all the incredible systems and structure and organization and design and inner working relationships you really think about that and and that is very preposterous but as time goes by even the scientists are second-guessing the theory of evolution number two not only the law of conservation of mass you've got the law of entropy and the second law of thermodynamics says that nature tends from order to disorder in isolated systems 
you, you know, if you stack three rocks or four rocks on top of each other on a hill to mark a trail, if time goes by, they tumble. If you have a beautifully manicured garden with everything, all the rows nice and clean and neat and the vines are trained, leave it alone for three years and what happens? Things tend towards chaos and they disintegrate and they lose their energy and they break down. But what we see is we see a, a universe where there's order and design that intelligence and energy has been invested in all these different systems. Something from the outside created these things. So you've got the law of entropy. Then you've got the law of biogenesis. The law of biogenesis basically says that all existing life came from life. You know the old adage, which came first, the chicken or the egg? He said, well, the egg, well, you need a chicken to lay an egg. So, well, the chicken came first. That chicken had to come out of an egg. All life comes from existing life. Now, friends, I, I don't know if you've thought about this, but it doesn't matter how many textbooks you write. It doesn't matter how many universities you found that say that we've got scientific proof. There's not a single example anywhere in the world in the history of man where we have observed life springing from non-life. Even if you say, well, that plant came from the seed, the seed is life. And that in itself is a miracle. They've got seeds that they've pulled out of pyramids, they've sprouted. How do they contain that essence? But those date seeds that they got from the ruins of Masada 2,000 years old, you know what? They grew a date tree. And that date seed needed another date tree to create the seed. And it keeps on going back that way. So the law of biogenesis makes it pretty clean, clear. And when you think about it, in order for there to be life and these cells of life, each one of these individual cells are extremely complex. You see, back in the days of Louis Pasteur and um, you know, some of the early people who developed evolution, when they would look through a microscope and they would look at a cell, they saw a very simple um, object that seemed to have three components. You had the cell wall and you had this like plasma and then you have the nucleus. And, and so when you told them that life could develop spontaneous, they called it spontaneous generation. They actually believed that life could spontaneously just start. And Louis Pasteur disproved that. One reason they believed it is they noticed if they left some meat laying out for a few days, that pretty soon maggots would develop. And they said, these maggots just developed out of nothingness. Well, Louis Pasteur said, you put, those, put that meat in a vacuum and prevent flies from laying eggs on it, you're not gonna see life. Now, when we look through a microscope at a single cell of life, it is infinitely more complex than anyone could have imagined. I've got a few quotes here from some scientists that talk about that. Um, Dr. Stephen Bloom said, a single human cell, like a skin cell or a liver cell, is far more complex than the space shuttle or a nuclear submarine. One scientist said, one single cell of life is more complex than New York City with all of its inner working systems at rush hour. All of the systems and the machines and things and the chemical reactions and they're all communicating and they're doing cleansing and they're processing gases and they're sending out signals to the other cells. It is mind-boggling now. And that's why there's a crisis among a lot of evolutionists because they realize while they defend evolution, they say there must have been some higher intelligence because you know what they do. They've made a religion out of it. And, and you can... You can watch you know, the History Channel or Discovery and some of them, and you see these beautiful nature programs, and I love the photography, I'll just admit. And you'll hear the narrator say, isn't it wonderful, the genius of evolution that helped these creatures develop these attributes and features, and how, isn't it wonderful, the brilliance of Mother Nature, how smart she is, and I'm going, why are you saying evolution is a genius? Why are you saying Mother Nature is a genius? Why don't you say God can't do that? Let me tell you what's at the foundation of the religion of evolution, is we really only have two choices. Either there is a higher power that designed and made everything, that is beyond our comprehension, 
or everything happened accidentally for no reason, with no purpose, which is also beyond our comprehension. But if you believe that there's a higher power, that means that there may be a, a, a reason for your life and there may be an accountability for your life. There may be moral guidelines, and so many people can't afford to believe in God because they don't want to submit their lives to those values. So they spend their lives fighting that fact and trying to create some other scheme, some, some other scenario to explain the existence of everything. Hence, evolution. But uh, the more I studied it and looked at it, I thought, how in the world did they ever believe that? Well, that's what I was told over and over again. Who is it, Lenin, that said, Repeat a lie often enough and people will think it's truth. Life is so complex. You know, the uh, world's most powerful supercomputer right now is in Japan. It's called the Fugaku. It's made by Fujitsu. They developed the name somehow honoring Mount Fuji. This computer, this is, it's beat out the computer in China. It's beat out the IBM's computer, the Summit computer. This is as of December 2021. It broke all the records. It smashed the records. This computer can conduct more than 442 quadrillion calculations per second. It has 158,976 nodals and processors, and that's a picture of it there on the screen, that fit into 432 of these tower racks, 432 of them, using 26,000 kilowatts to power it. And do you know that that computer still has not reached the level of the artificial intelligence that can match the brain of a mouse? Do you know it spent a, they spent approximately a billion dollars building this computer, and they cannot replicate the intelligence of a mouse. And yet there are intelligent people that think that a mouse brain happened by accident. Can you see why I struggle with that? Let me see. I've got a little illustration here. I hope this goes okay. Alas, from the foliage, I've discovered something. So this, this used to be a pen. And uh, it fell from my desk several times and developed aerodynamic design. I'll make sure I get the control in the right hand here. Now, you did fill out an insurance form before the service today? And that all began with a pin falling off my desk. And it broke, and half of it turned into the remote control, and the other half turned into this engineering wonder. <laughs> Do you know how they designed this little bird? They looked at how a real bird flies. And they studied the wing flaps of a real bird to do this. Do you know how they design submarines? They look at porpoises and dolphins and how they break through the water. Do you know how they design jet fighters? They look at the body of a swift, fastest bird next to a peregrine falcon. And to think that here we obviously, if I told you that this thing just showed up in my desk one day, you'd never believe that. But to think that we can support that in the other areas of life, how in the world can we have them teach that to our children? That you came from nothing once a long time ago out of nowhere for no purpose. This is the teaching of evolution and it makes it very difficult to worship him that made when we're surrounded with this religion. And what concerns me is you hear something often enough, even Christians, I hear them uh, muttering, yeah, millions of years ago. Well, let's go on here with our presentation. Not only do we have the complexity of life, there are so many symbiotic relationships in life 
that things could not evolve at the same time without depending on another creature, a plant, an insect, an animal. Uh, you know that there are many flowers that will not pollinate without bees or butterflies. And you think, how did that flower manage to survive billions of years without the insects? Or how did the insects that feed on the flowers survive without the flowers, but yet they cannot exist without one another? There's a beautiful hummingbird. It's called the, um, I think it's called the swordbill hummingbird. It's got the longest bird bill of any creature compared to its body size. You wonder how the little thing can fly. But it's got that, that long nose, and it just is designed perfectly to fit into a particular flower. And the flower needs the bird to pollinate the flower, and the bird needs the flower to get the nectar. And evolutionists cannot come up with a scenario where they would both evolve simultaneously to need to exist with one another. So you have all these symbiotic relationships. Oh, there's another neat one. Uh, you've got yeah, these. In the ocean, there's these goby fish. They've got good eyesight, but they're not very strong. But they pair up with a shrimp. And the shrimp has got strength, but it's virtually blind. And all through the day, the shrimp is touching the fish to see where the fish is. And the fish, but he can sense when the fish says there's a problem, they both go in the hole together, and the shrimp protects the fish. And when did they sign a contract to work things out that way? <laughs> There's a tarantula that is friends with the frog. They travel together. Tarantula could easily kill and eat the frog, but it, it'll eat everything else, but it won't eat that frog. And the frog doesn't bother. He's not afraid of the tarantula in several countries. And I could just go through all of these different symbiotic relationships through nature and how these things could develop and evolve so that they depend on each other is incomprehensible. Then you've got the flood of evidence that you would see in geology. Uh, all around the world, there's evidence for a great flood, according to the Bible. You know, and even in the histories of the world, you can go to several different countries. And for instance, the Hawaiians had a story about a man named Noe, who uh, survived a great flood in a canoe with his family and some animals. And the Mesopotamians had a story called the Epic of Gilgamesh. And in China, I just read uh, recently that there's a group of scientists in China that are saying the legends that they've heard about a great flood in China that covered the whole land, they thought were myth. The geology is saying it really did happen. And as you look around the world, and you can see that there was some catastrophe you look at the fossil beds. I think we've got one that is going to go up on the screen here for you in just a moment. You can see from the evidence of these fossils where millions of animals died suddenly and were buried. You realize to make a fossil, um, if an animal dies and it just lays on the ground, it gets picked apart and eaten by scavengers and birds of carrion and, and it decomposes. In order to have the fossils that they have, they need to die and then be buried very quickly by, by sediment or by ash. And that requires a catastrophe. And all over the world, you can see in the geologic record and through the fossils evidence that there was a massive catastrophe where animals were covered with uh, volcanic ash or floods. And I remember for years when I was going to school, they'd say, yeah, um, all the dinosaurs seemed to die out. They got a disease. Back in my, my day, some disease wiped them out. And then as time went by, they said, well, no, it seems that the fossil... I said, you know, what about a flood? And they said, no, 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 not Noah's flood. But as time went by, the evidence could not be refuted that they were covered in some massive flood catastrophe. So then it became an asteroid. An asteroid struck the Earth and it caused tsunamis. And if it wasn't an asteroid, because they say for an asteroid to wipe out all the dinosaurs, how come the big dinosaurs all died, but the little squirrel mammals lived? And then they said, well, it, it may have been a volcano or an earthquake that caused a tsunami. But the evidence around the world is all of these creatures were covered very rapidly with, settlement, with sediment and preserved. Well, but what about, Pastor Doug, they're found at different layers. Here's an interesting, um, interesting fact. If you ask an evolutionist, how do, you, how do you date 
the layers in this geologic column? They said, well, it's based on the fossils that we find in those layers. Okay, well, how do you date the fossils based on the layer where we find them? Did you catch that? That's called circular reasoning. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. And why are some of the creatures at different levels? Well, a fact of biology is that when different creatures drown, different species have different oxygen density and different creatures will bloat and float, I know that's not pleasant to think about, and sink at different times based on what kind of, you know, a reptile will sink sooner maybe than a mammal, for example, especially amphibians, and you're going to find them at different levels. And so there have been so many assumptions that have been made that just really haven't been thought through. Well, got to make sure I don't get too far ahead of myself. Next, you've got uh, what they call living fossils. Now this to me is another slam dunk. A living fossil, what is that? Well, that's talking about a creature that they at one time thought was dead. They thought that it was extinct. And in some cases they thought it was extinct for 60 million years or more. And then lo and behold, they find one alive. Now, exhibit A is a fish, you see him on the screen here, he's called a coelacanth. And when they saw fossils of the coelacanth, they said, here you have an example of a missing link. This is a fish that was developing proto-legs. See the little stubby fins? They said that's because he was slowly developing legs, he would crawl across the bottom and eventually crawl up on land, and those fins would turn into full legs. And they had this as a missing link that had been extinct for 60 million years. But then they were fishing off of the east coast of Africa, and lo and behold, they pulled up a living coelacanth. And they've, you know, caught many others since then. They live very deep. They find out they're still very much alive. Now here's the question. Think about this. The supposition of evolution is that creatures are always going through dynamic changes trying to improve themselves and through survival of the fittest and natural selection they're somehow striving for the mastery and for success and to grow and to improve and so you know as time goes by the pencil continues to fall to the ground it develops aerodynamic wings and, and it's always trying to get better so it doesn't hurt so much when it hits the ground why is the coelacanth still crawling on those stubby legs after 60 million years. Why are the fossils identical? Another example of a living fossil is a horseshoe crab. Now, you don't have them here in California, but I remember back on the East Coast, we'd see them on the beach, and it is the creepiest creature in the world, especially when they flip over and they got all their legs going like this, and they're upside down in the water. But there you have a picture of a modern horseshoe crab. Now, listen carefully. The one on the left is a fossil 500, nearly half a billion years old. 450, they're estimating, million years old. They haven't changed. The poor thing, they, they've got very primitive eyes. Why haven't its eyes gotten any better? If evolution is true, you would think it would be uniform across the board, that everything would be transitioning to get better. These guys got passed up, it's just not fair. In fact, the horseshoe crabs now are smaller than some of the fossils. Another example in this is, have you heard of the Megalodon? When I w grew up in New York City, I lived across the street from the Museum of Natural History, one of the most famous museums, if not the most famous in the world, maybe next to the Louvre, but as far as natural history museums. And my brother and I, you could go free. It was across the street, 81st Street, New York City. I used to walk across the street all the time and roam through that entire museum. And you heard about the movie they made called Night at the Museum. I was the kid that almost got locked into the museum at night because I love roaming around the museum and sometimes they'd be locking the place up and I'd still be looking. I wanted to be a paleontologist. I'd see these great big statues of the Stegosaurus and the Brontosaurus and the Tyrannosaurus Rex and I was so fascinated by that. Now, friends, I was in deep with evolution. But I remember right across the street, they had the jaw of a megalodon, this huge shark mouth, and that a person, they, you could drive a Volkswagen through it. Now they're making all these movies about these, these massive sharks. Do you realize sharks 
have remained basically unchanged according to evolution for 150 million years. They say they're very successful. They got to this point of success and they just stop. Well, wouldn't they want to get out of the water and crawl around? Evolutionists say that these, these creatures, like seals, managed to grow legs. They got out of the ocean and they crawled around on land and they were more like cows and then they decided to go back in the water and they turned into whales. Honest. How many of you have heard this? Whales used to once be land creatures. They come up with that because they look at the bones and they, they fit, since they're breathing air, they, they must have been land creatures and gone back to the sea. Well, they did all that in the time a shark never got out of the water. That doesn't make any sense. If evolution is going to be true, it's going to happen across the board. You get all these living fossils. We have a few sitting here today. Now, while I'm talking about evolution, I need to be fair. <clears throat> And listen carefully, I do believe in what you would call microevolution. And this is what has confused so many people. What Darwin observed was really microevolution. That is changes over time within a species that stays the same species. Like I said, you've got, uh, well, here, let, let me just show you what's on the screen there. This is a National Geographic magazine from January 2002. I took a picture of that because it says, from wolf to wolf, as they study the DNA of dogs, they realize that all the dogs in the world, and look at the great variety of dogs, you see, oh, poor, that poor little chihuahua is no bigger than that can. And I think it's full grown. That all the different, and think about all the different dog varieties that have developed in the last 200 years. I can't even say some of their names, not in church. And they're, you know, they, they got the, some of them are all naked, they got no hair, some of them are just a ball of hair, some of them have all this saggy skin, some of them are like racers, and, and they're all bred with these different traits, and by the way, they found as they continue to breed them and breed them and breed them, instead of becoming more sophisticated, they become more prone to genetic problems. But they say they can trace the DNA of every dog in the world back to two original wolf-like dogs. How many did Noah need on the ark? Only two. They're unclean animals. Only two. I thought that was interesting that National Geographic would say that. In the next slide, you, you can see, look at the great diversity you'll find of dogs. And another example of microevolution might be, you've got like the Arctic hare. The Arctic hare, it's a rabbit. Rabbits and hares are related. And then you've got desert hares, and the desert hares are brown, and they are both hares. But the Arctic hare, in the winter, it has, that's a picture of one that's shedding. He's going from his winter coat to his summer coat. Somehow, through living in this snow environment during the Ice Age, they began to adapt to their climate. Has that happened with humans around the world as well? You will see examples of microevolution. God did something amazing within our DNA where when you in your life experience certain things, you transfer those experiences that actually affects your DNA, you can then uh, transfer from you to your offspring some of those traits. An example, I just got done reading a book about um, some mountain climbers that go to Everest and they always use these Tibetan Sherpas because they live above 14,000 feet consistently. Their bodies, these Tibetans, are much better at processing oxygen because for generations, their ancestors have lived at these high elevations. They pass that ability on to their offspring. How does that happen? Through living. There's a little microevolution that ha happens and they're able to better process oxygen because they've somehow transferred that advantage but you know what? They stay humans. And all the dogs with all the changes in the different varieties of dogs, they are still dogs. And yes, you can breed a Chihuahua with a great name. I don't know what your mind going there right now during church, but I'm just letting you know that they're all dogs and you'll get dogs out of that. So yes, there, are, there is something called microevolution, but what you do not have is an alligator turning into a bird. There are no, and doesn't the Bible say God made each one after their kind? 
there is not a single case in known history of macro evolution where one species turns into another species. You can get doctors that will write all kinds of papers, but anyone can make anything up, but they haven't observed this happening. And yet evolution is not based on microevolution, it's based on macroevolution. That, you know, you've got the squirrels turning into horses. And they're just totally different species. So, then you've got the, uh, the missing links. Not only have we not observed the changing from uh, species, the transitional forms are missing. Even Darwin admitted, he said, you know, if evolution has happened from one kind into another kind, he says there's a, a terrible vacuum of these intermediary types. We call them the missing links. You'll find hundreds of examples of uh, different species of dinosaur around the world, but you don't find the transitional forms from a dinosaur to an alligator and an alligator to a bird. And you know, they say dinosaurs are, are bird-like. And um, I just got done reading another book about uh, some explorers that went to the South Pole to study penguins because they saw that penguins had what looked like scales on their feet and they wondered if these penguins could somehow be the missing link where those scales are similar to reptile scales and they went through this expedition and several people died and they came to the conclusion, these are evolutionists, at the end that there was no link between the scales on a penguin's feet and reptiles. They, they're just missing. And you know, the, the leakies go to Africa and they find a piece of a skull. They find just a little piece of a skull. And they construct a whole skull out of that and they say this is the missing link. Well, they take a lot of creative license when they give that little piece of a skull to a sculptor and they tell the sculptor this is what you, we want it to look like. And so what they do is they take the fragments of a monkey or a gorilla and they try to reshape it and say this is evolving into man. There are very, very few even cases of this. They can find fossils of apes and monkeys and humans all over the place, but they don't find the transitions. And you know, it's so important for you to understand what the Bible says. We are made in the image of God. In the London Zoo a few years ago, and matter of fact, they did it uh, recently also, with all their different exhibits, they created another exhibit, they put it right next to their primate exhibit, and in this exhibit they put several men and women wearing fig leaves. And the students from the schools would go and they'd look at the primates and then they'd go and look at the homo sapiens. And these actors or models, whoever they were, they'd walk around in this caged area and they said, we just want people to understand that humans are not any more special than the other animals at the zoo. So they put humans in cages next to the other animals and they say they're just another animal. Now if you continue to tell people that and you tell young people that, how are they going to feel about the importance of their life? You're just a highly evolved monkey. Now, you might think, well, Pastor Doug, oh, by the way, I know they find paintings inside caves and they find evidence of cavemen out there in uh, different parts of the world. And uh, do you realize that there are still cavemen living in the world today? I lived in a cave. And so, the same time that the pyramids were being built, at that same time in history, there are other parts of the world, people said, hey, let's build a cave, or let's live in a cave. And so because some people lived in a cave doesn't mean they had no intelligence, and even today, I've been to all different parts of the world, there are some people that live in much more sophisticated environments than others. Some live a very primitive existence, and some live a very sophisticated existence. That's always been the case. So just because they say, well, we, got, we found bones in a cave. That doesn't mean that these people that lived there were not intelligent humans. Something else, that I'm just, again, I'm just sharing the thoughts that I had to process for me to have absolute confidence and peace that we were divinely created in six literal days. If, if humans are now kind of ruling the world, I mean, we're saying that you and I are going to fix the world. We've, we, you know, we're going to make laws and we're going to save the world. If humans are ruling the world, 
then why is it that a gazelle can get up and run 10 minutes after it's born and we can't even roll over 10 weeks after we're born? Why is it that if we're so highly evolved, we got to kill other creatures or use their fur to cover ourselves up or we'd freeze to death? Why is it if we've evolved, why is it that we have evolved 90% more brain than we use in our lifetime? Explain that. Why would you evolve? Some use more, some use less. <laughs> but approximately, we don't use a fraction of our brains because we were meant to live eternity with God. Well, why are there similarities among the various species? It seems like, you know, as you go from place to place in the world, um, they say, well, you know, Squirrels can be a little bit like monkeys, they can be a little bit like men, they can have fingers and they can have eyes and their faces are facing front and you, you can look at all these characteristics and they say, well, they're similar, one must have evolved from the other. That's not clear reasoning. If you go out here onto Interstate 80 and just watch, you're going to see all kinds of vehicle, vehicles go screaming and rip snorting by. You'll see 18-wheelers, and you'll see motorcycles, you'll see pickups, you'll see sports cars, you'll see uh, battery-driven cars, you'll see all different kinds of vehicles. And they are all coming from different factories that were made uniquely by different designers. But they will all have many things in common. Most of them will have rubber tires. They're going to have an electrical system. Some of them will have an eternal combustion system. Some are running on batteries. They'll have windshield wipers. They're going to have lights. Why? Because they are operating in the same environment, so they need certain things in common. Did you hear me? The reason there are creatures in the world that have similarities is because we live in the same environment. We're going to need wings or tails to swim with, or feet to walk with, or hooves or something to move. We're going to need fingers or claws or something to grab. We're going to need eyes so that we can see where we're going, so we don't bump, unless you're a horseshoe crab, so you don't bump into things. But to say that one must have come from the other and come from the other because you see similarities, we see no example of that happening anywhere in the world today. Just like, yeah, you've got all kinds of different vehicles driving the roads because they share the same environment. And then, final point would be the dating dilemma. Now I save the best for last. The whole house of cards of evolution is held up by a belief that the things that you see, that the life around, developed over millions and millions of years. Now firstly, it is impossible to prove that scientifically. The best way to prove that is if you had a time machine, someone could live in the future, they could observe conditions in the future, they could have an accurate time machine, set the date, go back, and observe what it was like a long time ago. There is nobody alive, or ever has been, that can go back a million years and tell you what things look like, other than Jesus. So, it's impossible to prove that the dating methods that they're using are accurate. And as you read the literature, it becomes very clear that there's a lot of problems in the dating. Let me read something. Carbon-14 is produced in the Earth's atmosphere. I'm reading from an encyclopedia. When nitrogen-14, or N-14, interacts with cosmic rays, scientists believe, notice that, that cosmic rays have been bombarding the atmosphere ever since the Earth was formed, while the amount of nitrogen in the atmosphere has remained constant. They're believing it has been the same. But, listen to this, scientists are not certain that this ratio has been constant. Errors in radiocarbon dating can be caused by inaccurate radiation or particle counts, contamination of a sample with more modern carbon and stray radiation striking the counter, or other things. This is Compton's Encyclopedia when you look at how they're dating. If you walk in a room, I'm going to tell you, all right, you walk in this room here, you open the door, you walk in the room, there's going to be a candle burning on a bar stool, wax candle. I want you to tell me how long that candle has been burning. So you walk in the room and you think, all right, well, I'll take my stopwatch and I'll measure and see uh, how quickly it burns 
But then you got another problem. You don't know how tall the candle was when it started. You got to know that. And let's suppose you could take a wild guess at that. Then you've got another problem. You don't know if the candle was burning the same speed before you opened the door and let the air in that changed its burn rate. We are guessing at the age of the earth based on several assumptions. We're guessing on the age of the earth based on believing that everything now is like it was back then. Let me give you something to think about. So when God made Adam, did he have a belly button? That's really not my question. I just threw that in there. So when God made Adam, did he have to learn how to walk and talk, or did he make him from the factory with pre-installed hardware or software where he knew how to talk? Was Adam made a baby, or was he made a full-grown man? He was made with a certain amount of age built in. Are you with me? Would you agree with that? So the first trees that God made, massive trees, did they have tree rings? Tree rings are caused by, you know, growth. They're growth rings, but they also are used to help uh, transport the moisture from the roots to the leaves. And so why would God not have rings in the original trees that he made? So he makes them, so if a dendrochronologist, people who study tree rings, if he goes and cuts down a tree that was made by God, he would have the appearance of age in the tree. Even though the tree might be one hour old, it might look like it was 6,000 years old. You see what I'm saying? And to me, that's something else I think is very interesting, is that as you go around the world and you look, we see that there's this problem in history where it's just amazing to me how man suddenly appeared 5,000 years ago. He goes from dragging his knuckles to all of a sudden building pyramids. And, and I think I said before, I've been to the Great Pyramids. I've been to different parts of the world where they have incredible ancient structures. They don't even know how they moved the stones. Dr. Schweitzer did some experiments. They found a Tyrannosaurus Rex, supposed to be 60 million years old, thigh bone. They sawed off some pieces of it, and these are, not, these are evolutionists that, that did the study. They found that there was living, not living, but I should say soft tissue inside the bones, this very massive bone of a Tyrannosaurus rex, supposed to be 60 million years old. They had added some chemicals to the sample, and all of a sudden it became soft again. They could even see blood cells. I don't know how you'd see anything after a million years, let alone see, you know how long a million years is? 60 million years, still soft tissue? Yeah, that stuff doesn't always make the headlines. You can look it up. You can see these are the actual pictures that they had. They published a study on it. They were mystified by this anomaly. Maybe things aren't as old as we thought. And you know, for me, and I, I wonder how I can say this appropriately in church, but sex. I said it. I always got everyone's attention, too, when you do that. If the original single simple cells of life reproduce by splitting, and then those split, and there's still cell replication that happens that way, why would it become necessary for species to have two separate genders? How did that happen? Can you picture the day where cells, they wanted to, you know, start a family and the cell would just split? You got two. And then all of a sudden, this cell says, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to bring you flowers. And you're going to give me a necro. And now we're going to, instead of just splitting, you can't reproduce without me. There is no scenario in evolution that explains that. That there needs to be the cooperation of, I mean, they talk about the genetic advantages of, you know, mixing genes for stronger offspring, but they can't explain why that would be practical. And yet God made man in his image that through an act of love and co cooperation that two become one flesh, and in their offspring, that child has the, the DNA and the genes of the two parents. They're living testimony that it's, it's so beauty, and all of that is lost through these things. So, friends, I, I believe the evidence is clear. You know, one other thing that uh, I, I saw just a couple weeks ago, talking still about the dating dilemma, um, the woolly mastodons. They originally believed they all died out 10,000 years ago. 
You can look this up. I just saw a study in December. They said we were 50% off. They believe now that they have evidence from samples taken in the Yukon that they were alive 5,000 years ago, contemporaneous with man. And all they have to do is publish a new paper and say, you know, I guess we were wrong. They'll publish papers about everything except admitting that uh, in the beginning God made the heaven and the earth. All through the Bible, it gives us those verses that God is the one who created. If we do not believe that, we cannot believe in Jesus. The Bible tells us to worship him that made. Another thing to consider, right now, a lot of people in the world are worried that man is going to self-destruct. Humanity is going to destroy the planet. And uh, they just had a big conference on, in Glasgow about how we can try and rescue the planet. But uh, there's about 7.8 billion people in the world today, and population is still exploding. We've been to China, we've been to India, and it's amazing how many people are in the world. When you look at the rapid growth of population in the world, and I think I've got a chart of that, Karen, if you advance here a little bit. Yeah, there we go. You got the population problem. In just, if you go back uh, 500 years BC, and go to the next slide. Look at how the population of humans has just exploded from less than a billion to seven billion. It took 5,000 years to get the first billion people in the world. Then it only took 30 years to get the second billion. It took about 15 years to get the third billion. I was alive when there were three billion and now there's 7.9 billion. Oh, if, that's a, if it says million, that's a mistake, sorry. It's supposed to be billion. Those are billions of people. And so um, if you go backwards, if you extrapolate backwards, look at how quickly man has proliferated on the planet during that time. You can't have man on the planet for a million years. We'd be spilling and falling off into uh, space. You see what I'm saying? The Bible is very clear. God creates. And we can't believe that salvation is a result of evolution. Some people believe in salvation by works. That's kind of like evolution. I'm going to work my way to God, little by little. But salvation believes in a God that can create instantly through his word. The Bible tells us that God said, let there be light, and there was light. And as a result of that, that's Genesis 1 verse 3, Light happened. God spoke, the Bible says, and it was done. Now, do you believe that you've got to evolve your way into being a Christian? Or do you believe that through faith in his word, a miracle of creation can take place and you can become a new creature? This is the point that I have been driving through, or to, through the whole message, is that it is crucial for us to understand that he made miraculously, instantaneously by his word, or you will not believe he can do that in your life, in your heart. God can, through his word, transform you instantly. Now, there may be growth and sanctification, but the new heart and the new birth can happen immediately. Like that thief on the cross who is hanging next to Jesus. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Verily I am saying to you today, you will be with me in paradise. That man experienced a miracle of new creation. He, by faith, accepted the word of the Lord, and a new creation took place. Even hanging there on the cross, he got a new heart. And God can still do that today. Through the power of his word, he can miraculously transform you. Now, friends, I realize we're living in a world that uh, is struggling with this truth. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 11. It tells us, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. First angel's message. Worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. If you understand that he is the creator of all things and that he made you in his own image, you don't, you don't have to believe in that it took millions of years for all these things to happen. Oh, but Pastor Doug, we know the speed of light and it's taking so long for the light of those stars to reach the earth. How could he have created these stars 
are these things 6,000 or a few thousand years ago? What did I say? Can God create things with a certain amount of age built in? When God makes a star, can God make a star with a light already in route for you to see at the same time? Sure he can. So, so many problems that evolutionists are having with the scripture is doubting the power of God. Friends, there's a lot of mysteries we don't understand, I'll admit. But as soon as you begin to doubt the power of God and the truth of his word, life begins to lose its meaning. You are divinely made in his image, and he has a special plan for your life. God wants you to be recreated. I believe there are some who are watching, some who are listening, and your whole worldview has been uh, sent off track because you've been listening to those voices that say we've slowly evolved from primeval ooze and from lower forms of life, and a lot of people are acting like animals because they're being told all their lives that they are nothing more than animals. But you are made in the image of God, and he is offering you his Holy Spirit to guide you. We are noble, dignified, miraculous creatures. David said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And unless we understand and believe that, your whole worldview is going to be tainted. So I would appeal to you, friends, to believe that first angel's message and worship him that may. Can you say amen? We're going to sing about that. One of the great hymns of the church, I sing the mighty power of God. And I'd like, there's three verses I'd like to invite you to stand. I think John's going to come out and help us. This is 88 in your hymnals, but I believe we're going to have the words on the screen. Friends, do you believe that God created, that he has the power to create instantly with his word, and that he can recreate each one of us? Amen? Amen. That's such a crucial part of these three angels' messages, this message that needs to go to the world, the last message is going to the world. I want to remind you, we're going to have prayer in a moment, but these meetings are not over. We're going to be meeting back here again at 2 o'clock today, and we still have the best yet to come, Pastor Loma Cain and others are going to be sharing. We have some guest speakers. And if you want to find out more about the seminar, you can go to afsummit.org. You can invite your friends and, their, and your neighbors and family. Let me pray with you as we close. Loving Lord, I am encouraged and refreshed just by the very clear truth 
both in your word primarily, but also the evidence. You said in the book of Romans that we can see that the creation declares your glory. The evidence is there. And I pray, Lord, that uh, people that may have been misguided or confused by the voices they're hearing coming from unbelief in the world, that you'll reveal yourself to them. Please bless, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. We thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.